Imagine a world, a different world. Your eight-year-old daughter has diabetes. She needs one shot of insulin a day, but you can only afford one shot a week. She has a seizure. You bring her to the hospital, but they turn her away because you're five dollars short. You've been coughing up blood and losing weight. You're diagnosed with lung cancer. It's early, and surgery will cure you, but the operation is three times what your family makes per year. You go back to your village and prepare to die. Maybe you're a wealthier person. Your wife needs to have her gallbladder removed, and you can afford it. But everyone knows that you have to have additional funds ready because you need to pay the surgeon extra under the table. If you have lots of money, you can get just about anything you want. An MRI or two, no problem. A kidney, that can be managed too. Impartial advice is the only thing money can't buy. Your doctor says that you have to take a new medication, but how do you know whether to believe him? You know that he gets paid by drug companies. Everyone has skin in the game. If you're a doctor, this world isn't nirvana either. Primary care doctors get paid the same amount as garbage collectors, so most have quit. Specialists are paid more, but because they're paid more to do more, the cost of healthcare is escalating out of control. And because patients pay so much for healthcare, they're angry when things don't go their way. A patient upset about the results of a sinus procedure stabbed his doctor with a butcher knife 20 times until she bled to death. Family members of deceased patients protest every day outside of hospitals. The sad thing is, most people can remember when things weren't like this. Just 30 years ago, this country had one of the best primary care systems in the world. Doctors were trusted and revered. Healthcare was virtually free, and everyone had access to primary and preventive care. So, what is this world? The cynics among us will say that this mess is healthcare in the U.S. The idealists will say that such a dystopic society cannot exist. Actually, this is China today, and I'll argue that unless we change course, this is what the U.S. is on the fast track to becoming. I never thought that I'd be here to give a talk on China. China is the land of my birth, but it's not my country. My parents were dissidents; they were jailed and tortured during the Cultural Revolution, and I grew up believing that the values that matter are liberty, democracy, equity, and justice. Well, I like to tell people that I became a doctor because I was ill as a child and I went to see so many doctors, but that's not the whole truth. Actually, when I was in second grade, my teacher thought that my handwriting was so bad that she showed it to my entire class to see. Well, that's pretty embarrassing, but then my principal found out, and instead of feeling sorry for me, she displayed my homework assignment to the entire school. Now this was China, and that man, 8,000 students saw my bad penmanship. They really took penmanship seriously in China, and they saw my name on it. So I was mortified, and I thought I'm not going back to school ever. And then my mother said to me, "Well, look on the bright side. I mean, everyone in China at that time wanted to be a doctor, so this means that you're way on the fast track to becoming a doctor." Well, I was eight when my parents and I left China and came to the U.S. on political asylum. We moved to this little town in the mountains of Utah, and all I wanted to do was to fit in. I learned English, but there were so many other cultural references that I didn't know. A classmate told me that he went to the dentist and got kryptonite, and I went around asking people what type of filling that was or where I could get some. I was so gullible. That I believed my friends when they told me that gullible is pronounced gullible. <laughs> well, eventually I did become a doctor in my adopted country here in the U.S. and I didn't think much about China. Actually, I was doing work in Africa, and most of my work was based out of the U.S. or Africa, until I met a man in a bookstore in London. See, I was about to go to South Africa for medical work, and I was browsing books in the travel section when this man came up to me, saying he's South African. Did I, by any chance, happen to be Chinese because he's about to go to China? And I thought, wow, this is meant to be. Well, it took me two years of asking him, "When's that China trip?" <laughs> to figure out that he was and actually going to China after all. 
I tell you that I'm gullible. <laughs> well, I say to him now, now that we're married, that um, that he's lucky because what if I'd been Korean or Japanese? You know what? what <laughs> What would his line have been? Oh, sorry, all Asian people. I just assume they're Chinese. <laughs> Or better yet, all Asian women look the same. That's just not going to fly. Well, about two years ago, I was given an opportunity to conduct research on the healthcare system in China. I traveled to 15 cities from Beijing to Inner Mongolia to Southern China and visited over 50 hospitals. In the process, I had unprecedented access to doctors, nurses, administrators, government officials, and patients. Given how much China has developed into this major world power, I thought that I would find a better version of the healthcare system that I had growing up. But instead of this utopia, I found a dystopic world. To start with, not one of the hundreds of medical students that I spoke with could articulate a good reason for being in medicine. It's what my parents said I should do, and he said, "I guess it used to be a good career." I studied it for so many years, so I better learn to like it. At some nursing schools, more than half the students dropped out and left healthcare altogether. It's no wonder when nurses give answers like, "Being a doctor is bad enough; nobody wants to be a nurse," and "I don't like patients. All I dream about is quitting to become a white-collar office worker." Everyone was deeply critical of the healthcare system. People spoke about the 1980s when universal healthcare was dismantled, and 900 million people, three times the population of the U.S., lost healthcare coverage overnight. Everyone had a story of family or friends, other loved ones who died, literally waiting in front of hospitals because they couldn't afford to pay. Doctors too were unhappy. Imagine that you're a doctor. You train all your life to diagnose and heal and listen, and all of a sudden you're told overnight that you are now a businessman. You have to work your patients for every last cent. So someone comes to you with a cough and runny nose. If you diagnose him with a common cold, talk to him about it, and send him home, you get paid 70 cents. On the other hand, if you order laboratory tests, a chest X-ray, and give IV antibiotics, you're paid $50. How long would you keep on doing the right thing, and counsel, and talk about prevention, and listen to your patients if that's not what pays? And what do you do when drug companies come to you to offer you up to five times your salary if you prescribe their medication, and patients come to you to thank you for your care by giving you additional funding? Now, if you are a patient and you hear that poor people get denied access to services, what do you want for yourself? You want everything to be done because you can pay for it, and because you have the money. Nobody's going to tell you about the risk of radiation of a CT scan, or that the newest, latest medication is actually untested, or that the invasive procedure you're asking about is dangerous. People got what they wanted, but at what cost? No doubt, China has been very successful. The government has lifted millions out of poverty. It is a major world power. My my father just went back to China to visit, and he couldn't even recognize the street that he grew up on. That's how much has developed. But there's a fundamental problem, a blind spot that's been missed in this rush towards economic reform. That blind spot is our belief that being a consumer enables choice, and that choice is power. Now I'm all for giving people information to have choices. But turning patients into consumers means that healthcare is no longer a right; it's a commodity, just like buying a computer. So your computer breaks down. You go to the store. If you don't have money, nobody's going to give you a computer. But if you have money, someone's going to sell you the most expensive model, the latest software, the newest plugins, and nobody will tell you that the $800 version is just as good as the $2,000 one. Apply this to healthcare, and you can see how it becomes possible to deny people access to life-saving treatment and to sell them unnecessary, even harmful interventions. The doctor-patient relationship turns into a transaction between salesman and client. I remember exactly where I was when I had this realization. I was standing over the banks of the Huangpu River in my native Shanghai. Growing up, it's where my mother took me every day. It's also where we sprinkled the last of her ashes. Several months before she died, my mother had come back to China to see our relatives. 
over the Huangpu River, my grandmother told me that that was only part of the story. My mother had breast cancer, breast cancer that spread from her breast to her lungs. She called a doctor in China, supposedly her friend, who said that he would recommend lung surgery to remove this mass. Now, my mother's own doctor in the U.S. said absolutely not that chemotherapy is a standard of choice, and that lung surgery would, in fact, weaken her immune system without adding benefit. But my mother became so convinced that she needed everything to be done, so she came back to China to get this procedure, this operation to remove part of her lung, that nobody would do in the U.S. I stopped wondering then why it was that she died of pneumonia shortly after she returned. My mother was a consumer; she got what she wanted, but at what cost? That blind spot and the consequences are not unique to China. I think of the U.S., where our healthcare costs are escalating out of control. By 2020, we'll be spending a quarter out of every dollar on healthcare. While millions of people are uninsured or underinsured, 30 percent of all tests and treatments done are unnecessary. It's far more profitable to peddle drugs and procedures than it is to talk about prevention. One in three doctors in the U.S., according to the New England Journal of Medicine, gets directly paid by drug companies or medical device companies. And doctors here in the U.S. are scared—not a patient killing us, but a patient suing us. So I ask you then: With this system of inequitous, inefficient, sick care, how far are we from the dystopia in China? As we think about the future of China, the U.S., and beyond, I urge us to keep three things in mind. First, as a society, we must decide that there are some things that are not for sale. Healthcare is a right. Protecting the environment. Some things are not commodities, and we have to safeguard these resources. Second, we need to realign incentives to help people be their best selves. In the U.S. and in China and other places, I've worked with many excellent doctors and nurses, people who genuinely mean well, who went into the profession for the right reasons to care and help people. Even the person who did my mother's surgery, I don't believe that he meant to do her harm. People don't intend to be swayed by monetary incentives, and we don't like to believe that we are that one person in psychology studies, the one outlier who can resist temptation. But why not just eliminate these pressures that make most people lose their way? Third, start with our principles and hold on tight. When I was visiting medical schools in China, I attended the induction ceremonies where students receive their white coats and recite the Hippocratic Oath. At one of the schools, the head professor, Professor Wu, asked the students to repeat after him. The last line was, "I, Professor Wu, hereby solemnly swear." I watched as every single student repeated that line verbatim after him with his name, Professor Wu, instead of his, instead of their own. It's not enough to just know our lines; we must all be mindful of our mission that's bigger than ourselves. Now, by no means am I romanticizing the communist state that's caused my family so much harm. When my husband and I first met, he asked me what I consider myself, and I said without hesitation that I'm American because it's the American values of liberty, democracy, equity, and justice that I feel so passionately about. But capitalism doesn't have to equate consumerism, and the beauty of a democracy is that all of us as citizens can decide what type of society we want to live in. I also don't intend to perpetuate the stereotype of the all-knowing American who's telling other countries how to do things. In fact, I'd like to end today by challenging you with one final thought: Could it be that China is in the position it is today because of the U.S.? In the 1970s, after the revolution, Chinese leaders were deliberating how to redesign their society. They saw our decisions about how we design our healthcare system, how we set our social priorities, and followed us. Maybe it's partially our fault that China has the dystopia it does today. To prevent further problems in our country, and to stop the rest of the world from following us down this path, we have to make a difficult decision. We must decide if it's important for us to preserve our core tenets of liberty, democracy, equity, and justice. If not, we know what the future will hold. 
If so, we must commit now to our principles and our mission. Thank you.